there was a lot of like client communication stuff was simple as like, Hey, can you give me a copy of this? Just a lot of admin stuff. Um, or Hey client, can you get, I still need this. So simple follow-up things, which now we can build automations around, uh, with, which we have done with our Salesforce. It's like client still owes us this information. The system sees this client still owes us the information. So now I can automate an email saying, Hey, Bob, we still need your W2, Bob, we still need this K1. And, uh, no human labor cost is actually going into that reminder now that we have it set up. Hey everybody, Roland Frazier here with another episode of Business Lunch, and I am very excited to uh, bring on not only uh, a brilliant guest that I think is going to drop a lot of knowledge for you guys, but also uh, one of my business partners, and his name is John Briggs, and John's got a company called Insight Tax that does all kinds of cool things. John, how you doing, man? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. And we we even overcame the unplug it and plug it back in to make it work computer challenges that we had at the beginning of this. We're one. geniuses. So, uh, <laughs> pro tip for everybody, unplug it and plug it back in. Um, would you give a little bit about your background and, and Insight Tax and then uh, then we can dive in? Yeah. So um, married, four kids, got my master's degree in tax from BYU. And um, it's interesting most universities kind of teach you to become a cog in the wheel of the bigger companies, uh, which makes sense because the bigger companies actually pay the universities to help with their recruiting efforts. And that, so that's fine. Yeah. Um, but then through my own experience as an accountant, I realized this whole idea of job security in the form of being a W-2 owner, a bit of a farce. And so I don't get it. How did that ever get sold? It's like, You've got one client, your employer, if that client is unhappy with you and fires you, you're screwed compared to, let's say you only have 10 clients and one of those 10 clients as an entrepreneur lets you go, you still got 90% yeah. of your, you know, it's like, I, how is that secure? Yeah. Working up unemployed every day is a little bit more secure than, I mean, I worked for a company that did 30 million in revenue and declared bankruptcy the same year and the company went kaput. 30 million in revenue and a lot of people were out yeah. of jobs. So um, I learned through the trial of, uh, you know, hard knocks that I think owning a business made more sense. And so uh, we just kind of started off. I came in, was coming from a situation where I just needed to put food on the table to support my family, working in a windowless office, uh, lovely times getting to know the janitorial staff that came around at 2, 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> and then from there, you know, my inability to say no, my desire to provide an experience for accountants, it was very different than the kind of like just squeeze every ounce of soul out of people like most of the companies do. I wanted them to enjoy life too and build them a culture that could do that. And so it kind of grew from there. From, so just me to now we have 215-ish team members uh, we do have remote team members across the country, but we have two physical locations here in Utah. Okay. And just because it's, I don't think it's completely clear. So what was your vision when you were saying, I, I just need to put food on the table so that that company goes under, you're out there. What happens next in that entrepreneurial journey? Yeah. So um, uh, unfortunately that wasn't uh, enough of a pain moment for me. So I went from working for that company to joining my neighbor's accounting firm. Um, and it was within a couple of weeks of me being there, I thought he was rewarding me for hard work. <laughs> he said, you know what, let me give you two and a half percent ownership of the company. Let me just make you a partner. Cause I think you're going to provide a lot of value. Come to find out, I think it had more to do with the fact that if you don't have money and the company goes under, you have to pay your employees. Uh, you don't have to pay partners. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, so that, I, this is a neighbor who it turns out not to be much of a friend then. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't great. Um, I won't go into all the details there, but he and his mom, who were the majority shareholders of this firm, were doing things outside of the tax world, making a lot of money that way, but then also using the business as a piggy, personal piggy bank. And so I ended up working for them for six months and received a total of $2,500 in compensation. Uh, 
because as partners, you know, I mean, in fairness, that's, that's a few hundred dollars a month. So, you know, (laughs) yeah, yeah. It worked out to be about three cents an hour. I think something like that. And, uh, and so you thought maybe you could do better. I thought literally it couldn't be worse. I I don't even know if I was arrogant enough to think, you know, maybe I could do better. It's like, but it couldn't be worse. I mean, working for six months, it's funny when I came home and asked my, or told my wife, I think I just need to leave. She's like, it's about freaking time. (laughs) Cause she's like, you've been miserable. So, so so then rather than get another job, you said, I'm going to do my own thing. Yeah. After, after those two experiences, which were the two in a row, I'm like, it literally, I just, let me just do this myself because uh, it can't get any worse. Like I'm already not putting food on the table. I'm already not making money. And I went right. from a bad situation with this company that declared bankruptcy to now this firm that was being poorly run. Like, yeah, let's just go out on my own. So was the initial idea to open an accountancy or a tax practice or to do the thing that you ultimately ended up doing, which we haven't explained to people yet, but I, I want to, but not until we get. There. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I had worked with Deloitte prior, so I had some tax experience. I had a master's degree in tax at that point, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the game of being able to look at all the different rules, going to the tax return and saying, wow, you know, if we claim this here as an itemized deduction, it's a little bit different if we claim it here as a business expense and your outcome. Like, I loved that game. So for me, it was, you know, that's a bread and butter thing I can fall back on. Let me just start preparing tax returns. And so, yeah, yeah, then my life became uh, your typical accountant until I realized there's got to be a better way. Um, yeah. And then How we, did you exp- do that? um, I was on my own for about a year and a half, two years almost. Okay. Uh, and then we hired my first assistant, you know, the first hire, that's always terrifying. <laughs> and then, yeah. And then from there it's like, okay, we need this person. Let's, let's hire. And yeah. So you were kind of going on the traditional trajectory there for a bit, right? Yeah. Ta- tax, mostly a tax practice, totally. right? Okay. So, and then what happened that made you say, I think that, I think I can grow differently that led you to where you are now? Um, I th- it was kind of one of those moments where you finally, things were going well enough that I could pause for a second and reflect on kind of the bad experience that Deloitte taught, which it happens to be the same model that the smaller accounting firm I worked for followed, which happened to be as I'm now networking more and meeting other accountants that they're going through. And, uh, you know, memories of my wife when uh, we first started off kind of having her annual breakdowns during tax season, like, you know, I'm a single mother. It's like, you're not, I'm supporting you, but you know, it hurt because uh, she was during tax season. She was a single parent. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, absolutely. you know, those, so all those things kind of combine to one of these moments where you're just sitting there is like, you know what? I know there's got to be a better way. I, I know that we can help accountants have a great environment. I think the company can be profitable and we don't have to work 70 to 80 hours a week. Uh, okay. and so, so then from there, did... we, yeah, we start evolving into, um, what can we do to make sure accountants don't have to work so many hours, but we still get the job done? Okay. What'd you come up with? Well, uh, come to find out is interesting. I actually just had this realization the other day as I was putting my own thoughts on paper. So as a CPA, you have to get CE continuing education credits. Um, you know, almost all of those focus on how to be smarter at being the tax person. And over the years, I've noticed not very many, if any, actually focus on how do you become a better operator? And uh, being smarter at taxes does not help reduce the hours that you work. But being smarter with processes, turns out there's a high correlation. If you can improve your business operations, efficiencies, systems, then you actually can work less. So it became a matter of what's the big, just focusing on what is the thing in our firm right now that's taking up the most time? How do we make that more efficient? Cool, we made that more efficient. And almost just from a Lean Six Sigma standpoint, looking at what's the next bottleneck that we can fix. Um, But in this case, we were looking at what's the biggest time consumption and is there anything we can do 
Uh, I remember one time we sat down with all of our accountants and at this point they were doing like a lot of the work. Um, and we just lit like everyone let's do like a giant brainstorm dump. What are all the tasks you're doing? And so then we did, uh, it's like a spoken wheel of what is it? It's an exercise that some consultants use, but it's like a hub and spoke modeling out. So we said, okay, this is Lynn and Lynn, what are you doing? And then we would draw spokes to the length of time that he was spending on the different things. We had a visual and come to find out as we did that with the whole team, about 80% of their work could be done by someone who has less experience and not even necessarily tax knowledge. So now I can bring in, um, they're not lesser people. They just are less expensive to the company because their skill set isn't the same, right? And so we could hire areas there to help free up time so that our accountants could spend time on the highest deliverable possible, which is something as all business owners, we should be looking at anyways for ourselves. Right. And what, what was that? What, what were like, was there one or two spokes that were particularly long? Um, there was a lot of like client communication stuff with simple as like, Hey, can you give me a copy of this? Just a lot of admin stuff. Um, or Hey client, can you get, I still need this. So simple follow-up things, which now we can build automations around, uh, with, which we have done with our sales force. It's like client still owes us this information. The system sees this client still owes us the information. So now I can automate an email saying, Hey, Bob, we still need your W2, Bob, we still need this K1. And uh, no human labor cost is actually going into that reminder now that we have it set up. <laughs>